Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains! going to kill us all, and today we are going to discuss aircraft yet again, planes specifically, that um, will do just that. These planes, for many reasons, depending on the model, are unspeakably terrifying to be involved with, to fly in general, and let's talk about that. These are five planes that are terrifying for the pilots. The Beechcraft Bonanza. What an exciting name. Little itty bitty general aviation aircraft. These little devils were introduced by the Beech Aircraft Corporation in 1947. They're six seaters, single engine aircraft that are actually still being produced today. And they've been in continuous production longer than any other aircraft in history. 17,000 have been built, and they've been insanely popular with amateur pilots all over the world. Yeah, that's actually where we're getting into the horror aspect of this story. Amateur pilots. These small planes are designed for, you know, people who can independently own their own airplane. To fly them recreationally for fun, or maybe for travel occasionally. It depends on the person. But the early models of this plane especially had some issues when it comes to crashing or breaking apart in midair. Now, I don't want to come down too hard on this plane, because many of the crashes, in fact the vast majority of them, had to do with pilot error. The V-tail design in particular, as unique and cool looking as it is, became known as the Fork Tail Doctor Killer, which is a darkly humorous way of explaining that, yeah, the doctors that fly these because they can afford it are getting killed by this plane. Because the V-Tail had some problems. There were a lot of crashes due to overconfident, wealthy amateur pilots, many of which were fatal, and there were also in-flight breakups. Dr. Killer has also described the regular tailed version as well, but through an analysis done by the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, it became clear that the Bonanza actually had a slightly lower accident rate than other types in the study. The vast majority of crashes didn't have anything to do with the design necessarily, but due to pilot error. The design was very prevalent, a lot of people bought them. So because of their high numbers, it just looks like they're incredibly dangerous, when in reality it's just that they're one of the most prevalent things in the air. However, it was realized that the V-tail was an issue. Structural failures involving that configuration caused the United States Department of Transportation and the FAA to conduct wind tunnel testing as well as actual flight testing, which proved that the V-tail configuration didn't actually meet the type certification standards under certain conditions. The tail had to be strengthened, which did reduce fatal incidents, which is good. But even despite that, it showed that there were still a lot of issues with pilots just not understanding how to handle a plane with that V-tail. Most of the failures involved visual flight rules into instrument meteorological conditions, or flying into thunderstorms, or airframe icing. These kinds of things can happen to a regular plane but the effect is a little bit different when you're dealing with the V-tail. The physics don't work the same, so inexperienced pilots may not realize what's going on or how to handle it until it's far too late to do anything about it. That particular tail design is very intolerant to imbalances that are caused by any kind of damage or improper maintenance, even just repainting. The V-tail's production actually stopped in 1982, although the conventional one, Model 33, continued until 1995. Model 36 is still produced today. And the truth is, the Bonanzas have a bad reputation mostly because of inadequate maintenance. Any other issues that have happened with them have to do with their prevalence and the fact that amateur pilots sometimes just don't do what they're supposed to do to take care of them. It's not like with a car. You have to actually take time out of your day to maintain these aircraft. If you don't maintain your car, let's say you decide to just let maintenance go on your car. Let's say that's a good idea. It's not. But let's say you did that. Generally, worst case scenario, your car will simply break down eventually. It'll just stop working. Maybe you won't put oil in it and the engine seizes up, or maybe the spark plugs go, or anything like that. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with your car, but most of them 
won't result in your horrible death. But if something goes wrong with a plane, there's a lot more that can kill you in that situation. It's true that in a straight-up engine failure, it's possible to get on the ground safely. In fact, many pilots will say that it's pretty easy to do as long as you remain calm and know how to handle it. But there are other failures that can happen with a plane, with the wings, or the stabilizers, or the tail, or the fuselage. There's so much that can go wrong that can result in a serious accident. And crashing a plane naturally can result in a much more grisly immediate death because you're falling out of the sky. So I guess what I'm saying is, the Bonanza does have a bit of a bad reputation, and that can make them seem a little scary to pilots, but the truth is, it has more to do with inadequate maintenance. If you own one, take care of your plane, and it'll take care of you. And if you don't take care of your plane, well, it'll still take care of you, but not in a good way, like in the KGB or Mafia-style take care of, if you know what I'm trying to say. The Boeing 737 MAX. Oh boy, this is a fairly recent story. It's technically not historical, since it's kind of ongoing. I mean, the lawsuit is over, as far as I know, and the Maxes are still in the air as of now, but boy, howdy was this a rough one for Boeing, and they totally did it themselves. This is what you get when you try to just get everybody killed, is really what was happening. So, the Boeing 737 MAX was the next big step in the successful line of Boeing 737s. Narrow-bodied airliners designed for, well, transporting people all over the world. Its primary users are Southwest Airlines, Ryanair, United Airlines, and American Airlines. They've been produced since 2014, and as of September 2022, 926 have been built. However, there was a bit of a major major flaw with the 737 MAX that resulted in so many people dying, um, yeah. The issue had to do with a unique feature of the MAX, which was the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS, which caused two fatal crashes, Lion Air Flight 610 and Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. It killed a total of 346 people, and it caused the whole fleet to be grounded worldwide from March 2019 to November 2020. The MCAS was not first implemented on the MAX. This was something that had been tested before. It was first installed on the Boeing KC-46 Pegasus military air tanker. The KC-46 required the MCAS because of the weight and balance shifts when a tanker redistributes and offloads fuel. It allows pilots to assume control of the aircraft and keep it stable. But on the MAX, the MCAS was intended to mimic the flight behavior of the previous generation of Boeing 737s, the next generation. That's what they were called. Not, not Star Trek, the, that's what they called this NG. NG, let's just go with 737NG. During flight tests, Boeing found that the position and larger size of the engines tended to push the nose up during certain maneuvers. So, they decided to use the MCES to counter that, because major structural redesign would have been really expensive and time-consuming. Boeing also wanted the MAX to be certified as another version of the 737, which would appeal to airlines and reduce cost of pilot training. The FAA went along with this and approved Boeing's request to remove a description of the MCES from the aircraft manual. So a lot of pilots, in fact most of them, were completely unaware of that system when the plane entered service. After the first crash, the Lion Air one in 2018, Boeing and the FAA still didn't reveal the MCAS and referred pilots to a revised checklist procedure that must be performed in case of a malfunction. Boeing then received many requests for more information and finally revealed the existence of MCAS in another message and mentioned that it could intervene without pilot input. According to them, the MCAS was supposed to compensate for an excessive nose-up angle by adjusting the horizontal stabilizer before the aircraft could potentially stall. Boeing denied that it was an anti-stall system, however, and stressed that it was intended to improve the handling of the aircraft overall. But after the Ethiopian Airlines crash, Ethiopian authorities stated that the procedure did not enable the crew to prevent the accident, which occurred while a fix to MCAS was under development. 
Boeing finally admitted that it had played a role in both accidents when it acted on false data from a single angle of attack sensor. In 2020, the FAA, Transport Canada, and European Union Aviation Safety Agency, EASA, evaluated flight test results with the MCAS disabled and suggested that the MAX might not have needed the MCAS to conform to certification standards at all. Later, FAA Airworthiness Directive approved design changes for each MAX aircraft, which would prevent the MCAS from activating unless both AOA sensors register similar readings. It would also eliminate MCAS's ability to repeatedly activate and allow pilots to override that system if they had to. The FAA began requiring all MAX pilots to undergo MCAS-related training in flight simulators by 2021. And the fallout of all this is huge! The 737 MAX has gained a horrible reputation as a result of it, when in reality nowadays it's probably fine due to the fixes involving the MCAS. Boeing suffered as well, as they should have since they tried to hide the whole thing. The Department of Justice filed a fraud conspiracy case against them, and Boeing paid $2.5 billion in penalties and compensation to settle it. Further investigations also revealed that the FAA and Boeing had colluded on recertification test flights and attempted to cover up important information. The FAA were also found to have retaliated against whistleblowers. Frankly, these days, the MAX itself doesn't scare me. It might have back then, but I wouldn't have known about the MCAS. What does scare me is that both Boeing and the FAA, both of which should be advised to maintain the safety of the aircraft, that's literally the FAA's job, by the way, um, colluded to make sure no one knew about this system. And to be honest, it seems silly overall, because why would you hide it if you thought it might be a problem why not just tell them about it? Oh, because Boeing wanted to make sure the MAX could be registered as another version of the 737, and they thought the MCAS may screw that up. But apparently, the FAA is in Boeing's pocket anyway, so I'm not sure it really would have mattered. And as a result, hundreds of people are dead, you lost billions of dollars, really, nobody wins in this situation. And that's what's scary about it. The Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-25, also known under its NATO reporting name, Foxbat. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I love this plane, but I'm more like its little brother, the MiG-31, as the MiG-25 paved the way for the outstanding 31. The 25 is scary for a few reasons, for the pilots and for the people surrounding it, when it first entered service. Because this aircraft was built by the Soviet Union, and it's one of the few combat aircraft built primarily using stainless steel. It was designed specifically to intercept spy aircraft by being as blindingly fast as possible. But when the West first learned about it, no one knew what to make of the thing. Everyone thought the Russians had made something that was light years ahead of the planes that everybody else had. When in reality, the MiG-25 wasn't as good as they thought. Its maneuverability and dogfighting capability was always questionable, but that was never the point of it. It was just meant to go really, really, really fast. It can theoretically exceed Mach 3 and have a max ceiling of 27 kilometers or 89,000 feet, though it wound up being restricted to a max speed of Mach 2.83. The reason is that it would destroy its own engines if it ever went faster than that. They put a lot of work into making sure the engines go fast, but if it did potentially hit Mach 3.2, its engines tended to overspeed and overheat, which could easily damage them beyond repair. They would literally shred themselves to bits going that fast. But the Soviets needed something fast, and something that seemed to be intimidating to the West. And from the outside looking in, without the technical information or knowing the risks the pilots of this plane would take, going that fast? Yeah, it was pretty scary to the West, at least at the time, until they realized the actual technical information and understood that the aircraft wasn't necessarily all it was cracked up to be. Sir, I'm losing track of the target. Comrade, you must go faster for the motherland. Ah, uh, sir, my engines are already making a really weird noise. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Comrade, you must brave it for a Soviet United Republic. We are, we are not a republic, and I, I think you know that. The people demand, comrade, that you go faster. 
Faster, faster! What would Stalin say? Stalin is dead, but his ghost will send you to Gulag if you do not go faster, comrade! I still think that's a bad idea. Comrade! Gulag! Faster! You! The Heinkel HE-177 Greif, or Griffin. This was a long-range heavy bomber that was flown by the Luftwaffe during World War II. It's notable as the only long-range heavy bomber to become operational with the, during the war. Despite only having two engines, it had a payload and range capability that was similar to four engine heavy bombers used by the Allies in the European theater. Development on it was difficult from the get-go. It was delayed several times, and they could never really figure out what role they wanted it for until the very end. When it finally entered service in 1942, um, well, there was one issue that was never really worked out, and that's, well, they caught on fire. Just all the time. They were just flying and they would burst into flames. The Daimler-Benz DB606 power system was selected, and in conjunction with the relatively cramped nacelles, that caused cooling and maintenance problems. They had a really, really nasty habit of catching fire mid-flight. The Luftwaffe air crews named them Reichsfusuk, or Reichslighter, or Luftwaffenfuzuk, Air Force Lighter. Either way, as a result, they were never as effective as they ever could have been. Plus, they kind of showed up a little late to the party. By 1942, long-range bombing was on the downslope when it came to Germany. The role of the Luftwaffe took a much more defensive stance within just the next few years. So the Griffin never really got to do what it was even meant for, all the while catching fire, which is bad for everybody involved. The Saunders Row A.36 Lerwick. Wait, Saunders? Saunders, you created one of the worst British aircraft in history? It wasn't me, Mr. Perlman, it's just a coincidence with the name. It's not that uncommon, I promise I had nothing to do with it. You failed me for the last time, Saunders. No, Mr. Perlman, not the chainsaw again, it wasn't me, I swear. So the Lerwick was a British flying boat that was built by Saunders Row Limited, or SARO, and it was meant for the Royal Air Force Coastal Command. But it always had a really, really flawed design, and they only ever made 21 of them. The plane was considered very unstable, both in the air and on the water, not suited for hands-off flying. The pilots had to pay attention to it, otherwise it would rapidly fall out of control. They made numerous modifications, but nothing seemed to work. Its undesirable characteristics stuck around. That included a really vicious stall, as well as unsatisfactory rates of roll and yaw. Additionally, usually aircraft with multiple engines can still fly if one of them fails. That's one of their best traits. If you have mechanical trouble in one engine, the other will get you through just fine. At least until you can get to an airport safely. But the Lerwick couldn't actually fly with just one engine. At all! It couldn't maintain height, and it couldn't maintain a constant heading. The controls couldn't counter the torque of one engine on maximum power which it had to be on maximum power to keep the plane at least in the air a little bit. Such a failure would inevitably cause the aircraft to fly in slowly descending circles. And on one occasion, the loss of the engine forced Lerwick to make an emergency landing in the Caledonian Canal. That aircraft was towed to Oban at the end of a string of coal barges, which just made the whole situation look a little bit embarrassing. Even though they still used it in service because it was World War II, whatever, does it fly? Fine, whatever, they just needed it. But like I said, they only wound up with 21 of them, and their accident rate is legitimately horrifying. Out of the 21, 11 were lost. 10 to accidents, and one for an unknown reason. Please recognize for me that the accident rate of the Lerwick was 50%. Half of the total airplanes that were made crashed, and not due to enemy action. They were all accidents. That's horrible. That's absolutely disgusting. They were retired within two years by 1942, still in the middle of the war, because the Royal Air Force probably thought it's killing more of our pilots than the Luftwaffe ever could. I, I think that's enough. I think we're good. We'll stick with anything but that. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, 
Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Alaric Jaspers, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Jack Parsons Railroad Videos, Ty Hammonds Jr., and Ohio Trucker 1. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.